My name is Eugene Pruitt, and I want to spend a few minutes with you today talking about the second coming of Jesus, particularly about the timing of that second coming, the time when Jesus will return. Before we talk, though, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I'm asking that you would bless us as we look at your holy Bible, that you would teach us what is right. I ask in the name of Jesus, amen. Do you know when Jesus is coming? Uh, do you know the furthest possible date? You know, I've been hearing some dates recently. For a few years now, I've been hearing that Jesus would come on or before 2031. And that was based on the idea that, that, that Jesus died at the year 4,000 and he'll come again at the year 6,000. Well, this week I heard that he'll come on or before the year 2027 based in a similar idea, on the idea that Jesus was baptized at the year 4,000 and that, or tempted at the year 4,000 and that he will come again at the year 6,000. And uh, you should just know in my short lifetime, these aren't the only dates I've heard uh, bouncing around for the final date or the latest possible date that Christ could come. I've heard 2012 and 2015 and the year 2000 and the year 1996 and 1998 and 1994. And uh, so we're going to spend some time looking at what the Bible says. And then for those of you who happen to be Seventh-day Adventist, we're going to look at some things written under the pen of inspiration about this same topic. If you have a Bible with you, turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, we're going to look at verse 14. It says... And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. When will the end come? It's when this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in Somalia, in Morocco, in Algeria, in Saudi, in Yemen, in Iran, in Iraq, in Qatar. In North Korea. That's right. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Well, I don't know how remote that seems to you, but I hope some of you listening will get some courage up and start reaching out to people in places where the gospel is just barely entering. Uh, I have friends now in the, quite a number of those countries I just mentioned to you who are studying the gospel. But I just want to say that the timing of Christ's coming in Matthew 24 is connected not to a cosmic clock, but to the doing of a work. When the work is done, the end comes. When the work is finished, the end comes. Do you know the sealing is connected in a similar way to the work? That uh, Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 talks about the timing of the time of trouble, the beginning of the time of trouble. And it says here in verse 2, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. So when does that time of trouble come? It comes when the sealing is done. Not when the cosmic clock hits a certain moment, but when that work of putting God's character into our foreheads is completed. That's when it happens. When does Jesus come back? Do you know the Bible addresses this very directly? Uh, turn in your Bibles to Revelation 14, just a few pages further. Revelation chapter 14 and uh, what you're familiar with there, possibly, is the three angels' messages in verses 6 to 12. After those three angels' messages, there's a special blessing pronounced on those who die in the third angel's message. That's in verse 13. And we're going to start in verse 14. Revelation 14, verse 14 says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. 
And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat in the cloud, that's King Jesus, he thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Did you catch it? When does Jesus harvest this planet? When does he send his angels from the east to the west to gather his saints together? It's when the harvest is ripe. When does he come? It's when the work is done. When does he send those seven last plagues? It's when the sealing is done. When does he come? It's when the harvest is ripe. And the harvest of God's people are ripe at the same time as when the world becomes ripe. You can find that a little bit later in the same chapter. Verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple, <clears throat> which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who, sat, who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. That's the seven last plagues. What I'm trying to say to you is that since 1844, as the judgment has been happening, God has put a burden and a work on his people. There's been an internal work of preparing for Christ's coming. There's been an external work of warning the world. He's given us both those works. And he said, when those works are done, he's going to come. It's the same idea you found in Christ's Object Lessons on page 69. I think you are familiar that when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his children, then he will come to claim them as his own. <clears throat> so you might be saying, well, what about 2027, the 4,000 years, the 6,000 years? What about what Ellen White said? Well, have you looked at what Ellen White says? When I say, have you looked, I don't mean, have you listened to what someone quoted to you, but I mean, have you looked? Frequently in my short life, I've noticed that when I listen to a man teaching, and then I look at the data myself, the feeling or the idea I get from those two pictures is so different. Even if the man is honest and sincere, frequently he leaves out the very things that seem to disagree with his conclusion. What he reads to you are the things that seem to agree with his conclusion. That's what men do. This is why Jeremiah was told, this is Jeremiah 17, Cursed is the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Now, when I was a younger man, and I will get back to the question about what Ellen White says, but when I was a younger man, I had a naive idea. I believed something like this, that good men teach truth, and bad men teach error. <clears throat> But history has proven to me that this is so wrong. Do you know that frequently good men teach error and frequently bad men tell the truth? So that when you want to know what's true, you can't afford honestly to just figure that out on the basis of the character of the one teaching. I mean, Martin Luther might say many things that are true and a few things that are just not true at all. And you know, James White also, he said many things that were true, but he wrote a few things that are not true at all. And, <clears throat> well, I could go on and on. And even those men who were great foes of the truth often said some things that were true. I mean, even the devil talking to Jesus in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 quotes Psalm 91. But you know how he quotes it. He quotes it accurately, but not thoroughly. That is, the part he quotes, he gets word for word, but he leaves out the part about 
God directing us where we should go. And when he leaves that out, it changes the, the message or the tenor of the thought. So I'm going to tell you what you'll find when you go to the statements yourself, but I hope that you've heard me. <clears throat> I mean, I hope that you will just take the E.G. White app, the little blue one or the red one, and type in 4,000 years, 6,000 years. You'll need to write the words out, 6,000, T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D, as opposed to writing the number, and see what you find. One thing you're going to find is that very often Ellen White used the word about 6,000 years. That's right, about 6,000 years. And you'll find that from the time she first mentioned 6,000 years to the time she last mentioned it, a period of many decades, she never says something like 5,940 or 6,014. It's always 6,000. Maybe some of you are teachers. Listen to me for a moment, you teachers. If I tell you that something is 14.11 centimeters long, you understand what I mean. <clears throat> I mean that to the nearest hundredth, it's 14.11. But if you were going to measure it to the nearest 10,000th, it might be 14.1086. When I say 14.11, I'm rounding to the nearest hundredth. In the same way, when I say that the, it's been a hundred years since the automobile was popularized in the world, I probably don't mean that it was exactly 1920 that the automobile was popularized, but I'm rounding. It, it would be sometime between 1915 and 1925. In every number that we use, <clears throat> whether we're prophets or whether we're priests or math teachers, we, we always have significant digits. In fact, when you look in the Bible, you'll find that frequently the size of armies is mentioned in thousands. It'll say 22,000 men died in a plague. Now, that doesn't mean that it was 22,000.00 men. It might have been 22,114 or 21,974. But you know when it says 22,000 that there's only two significant digits there and it's rounded to the nearest thousand. So I take exception when I hear people quoting Ellen White when she talks about 6,000 years, when quite often she says about, but sometimes she just says 6,000, when, when she says 6,000 years sin has been on this earth. And then they add the word exactly. Now, please, don't add the word exactly to the prophet. There's a difference between 6,000 and 6,000.0. When you add the word exactly, now you have made, you've made four significant digits. Well, I'm going to read you some statements and then talk about them. These are from Ellen White, and uh, I collected them this morning. And I'm going to read them to you now. I'll leave out the letter that I wrote to one of the teachers, and I'll just go to the statements themselves. This is from Early Writings, page 75, paragraph 1. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord. <clears throat> but it must not be hung on time. So I hope, friend, that you're going to take the third angel's message to your neighbors, to your cousins, to your work associates. Even if you can't go to work because of this COVID-19, you, you still are connected to them by Messenger or WhatsApp. You can share something of the message. If your character has been a rotten character, maybe do some repenting and apologizing before you share the message. What we just read is that it must not be hung on time. I saw that some were getting a false excitement 
arising from preaching time. But the third angel's message is stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own and needs not time to strengthen it, and that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. That's true. The third angel's message, that's about the mark of the beast, about the name of the beast, about the commandments of God, about the faith of Jesus. That message can and will go on its own power. If you could prove to your audience that Christ is going to come back in the next 42 months, that wouldn't add any power to the third angel's message. It would distract from the message. Anyway, let me just read to you more statements. This next one is from the Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971. After quoting Revelation 10, 6, do you know Revelation 10, 6? Revelation 10 is the prophecy of the Advent movement, and God prophesies about the disappointment there under those seven thunders. And then Jesus is pictured there as raising up his hand to heaven and swearing by him that lives forever and ever that there shall be time no longer. So El Mike quotes that passage, and I want to read to you what she says. This time, when the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 44, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. <clears throat> so if you want to know what's been prophesied, there are a number of prophecies in the Bible. How long does the longest one reach? Oh, that would be 1844. Since that time, we're waiting and watching. In fact, that's what we're doing because we don't know the time. It's why we have to watch. Let me read to you again. This is from the first volume of the Testimonies, page 72. <clears throat> These statements relative to time setting were printed about 30 years ago. That is, when Ellen White wrote this, she already was, had been in print for 30 years, arguing against time setting. And the books containing them have been circulated everywhere. Yet some ministers claiming to be well acquainted with me state that I have set time after time for the Lord to come. And those times have passed, <clears throat> therefore my visions are false. No doubt these false statements are received by many as truth. But none who are acquainted with me or with my labors can in candor make such report. This is the testimony I have carried since the passing of the time in 1844. Quote, time after time will be set by different ones and will pass by. And the influence of this time setting will tend to destroy the faith of God's people. So a prominent man was speaking recently about 1918 and 1919. Well, those dates are gone. And I'm afraid the fervor of some people will never be able to be revived. That's been the effect every time one of the dates has passed. Now, 2000, did I say 1918? I meant 2018, 2019. Now, we have coming 2027, that's a long ways from now, seven years. So it may be, it could be that Christ will come before then. But if it doesn't, then you can expect that fervor will begin to grow as the time gets closer. And then when the time passes, what would be the effect? Here's what it says. Time after time will be set by different ones and will pass by. And the influence of this time setting will tend to destroy the faith of God's people. If I had seen in vision 
definite time and had carried my testimony to it, I could not have written and published <clears throat> in the face of this testimony that all times it should be set would pass. For the time of trouble must come before the coming of Christ. Certainly for the last 30 years, that is, since the publication of this statement, I would not be inclined to set time for Christ to come and thus place myself under the time condemned under the name, under the same condemnation with those whom I was reproving. And I had no vision until 1845, which was after the passing of the time of general expectation in 1844. I was then shown what I have here stated. <clears throat> now, as I've been teaching for a number of years, I've encountered people who've said, there's no prophetic time after 1844, but there's literal time. And I just say, do you mean that when a prophet predicts a time in literal, in literal days or years that that's not prophetic time? Of course that's prophetic time. The thousand years is prophetic time. Uh, there is prophetic time anytime a prophet speaks about a time. And when we read these statements, these statements that talked about the message being stronger than time, it doesn't say the message is stronger than symbolic time or stronger than a day for year. It says stronger than an excitement that is based on a time or a date. This is from Testimonies to Ministers, page 55. Let all our brethren and sisters beware of anyone who would set a time for the Lord to fulfill his word in regard to his coming or in regard to any other promise he has made of special significance. <clears throat> That'd be like the latter rain, the judgment of the living. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Now, I reproved someone recently for what they added, so let me clarify. The statement didn't say the latter rain or the judgment of the living. I added that. What the statement said without my comment is, he has, it's a long sentence, let all our brethren and sisters beware of anyone who would set a time for the Lord to fulfill his word in regard to his coming or in regard to any other promise he has made of special significance. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. False teachers may appear to be very zealous for the work of God and may spend money to bring their theories before the world and the church. But as they mingle error with truth, their message is one of deception and will lead souls into false paths. They are to be met and opposed, not because they are bad men, but because they are teachers of falsehood and are endeavoring to put a falsehood, to put upon falsehood the stamp of truth. So I don't say that the man who promoted 2015 as the judgment of the living, or the man who promoted 2018 as the judgment of the living, or the man who spoke about the fall of 2019, or the one who recently mentioned 2027, or the man who taught about 1996 or 1994 or 1998 or 2001 or 2000, I don't say any of those men are bad men. In fact, we can't say whether a man has a good character or a bad character if we don't know him personally. And frankly, I don't know any of these men personally. They may be very good men. God may even have used them to do great things. God used David to do great things and to kill Goliath, but David sure made a big mistake when he numbered Israel. And you could think of other big mistakes he made. What I'm saying is men who set a date or a, a final limit date for Christ's coming, they need to be opposed. Now someone, a man who's been saying Christ will come before 2031, he says, I'm not setting a date because I say it'll be on or before that date. And I say to that man, do you even know what William Miller was teaching from 1833 to 1843? William Miller was never teaching that Christ will come back in 1843. 
He was always teaching he'll come back on or before 1843. He was teaching on or before 1843 all the way to March 1844, because for William Miller, the Jewish year 1843 was from the spring of 43 to the spring of 44. And then William Miller himself wouldn't even set a date in October 22 until just a few weeks before that date came. That is, William Miller, that great teacher, for more than a decade was time-setting and he was time-setting the very same way people are doing it today by saying there's a limit. It'll be on that date or before. And of course, when he said that in 1833, it didn't make so much excitement, but it made a lot more excitement by 1840 and a lot by 1841 and massive excitement by 42. And by 43, it was in the newspapers, headline news, because that's what time excitement does. It gets people's attention. And that's what God said won't happen again or shouldn't happen again. We don't need a message based on time. Anyway, I'm preaching. Let me just read you what I have. This is from Desire of Ages, page 632. But the day and the hour of his coming, <clears throat> Christ is not revealed. He stated plainly to his disciples that he himself could not make known the day or the hour of his second appearing. Had he been at liberty to reveal this, why need he have exhorted them to maintain an attitude of constant expectancy? There are those who claim to know the very day and hour of our Lord's appearing. Very earnest are they in mapping out the future. But the Lord has warned them off the ground they occupy. The exact time of the second coming of the Son of Man is God's mystery. Now, of course, I don't know anyone setting the day and the hour of Christ's coming. So someone's going to say that statement doesn't apply. But I hope you'll listen for part of it that does. This statement is where Ellen White interprets what Jesus said when he said that, No, not the angels in heaven, but the Father only. Now, I tell you that because Ellen White explains here in several places what Jesus meant by that, and it differs a fair bit from what James White said about it. So if you find someone quoting what James White said about it in the 1850s and 60s, I would ask them, what about what his wife said about it later under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? I would ask that. Finally, I want to read to you from the fourth volume of the Testimonies, page 308. Those who think that they must preach definite time in order to make an impression upon the people do not work from the right standpoint. The feelings of the people may be stirred and their fears aroused, but they do not move from principle. An excitement is created, but when the time passes, as it has done repeatedly, those who moved out upon time fall back into coldness, darkness, and sin. And it is almost impossible to arouse their consciences without some great excitement. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus put his hand up to heaven, and he swore by him that lives forever and ever that there should be time no longer. And he was saying, according to his own testimony through the prophets, that we have a message to take to the world, and the message isn't about time. We have a message to take to them that today is the day of salvation and that they shouldn't harden their hearts. But it's not a message that says they have one year to get ready or two or five. They might not even have six months to get ready. It might be much sooner. We don't know the amount of time we have. The message isn't about time. It's about work. It's about sharing. It's about the everlasting gospel. It's about the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And I would even dare say many of the people excited today about time know very little about how to show from this book what is the mark of the beast, what is the seal of God. Why you've heard, it, you've heard people preach that's connected with Sunday and with Sabbath, but do you know where the data is? I mean, you're locked down right now. Would you take some time and find it? 
If you want to get some help, I have a website, Bible DOC, Bible DOC, that's Bible document, .org. There's an article there on the mark of the beast and the seal of God. But you could find it yourself the way I did, just by digging, 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 praying, praying, praying. Is it worth investing a few hours, 10 or 20 or 30? It's worth all that and more. So what have I said today? Thank God people are getting ready for Christ's coming. Thank God the Bible speaks about the timing. It says when the gospel of the kingdom has gone to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people, when it's gone to all those nations, then the end will come. When the harvest is ripe, then the end will come. When the sealing is finished, then the time of, will begin of the time of trouble. Why, that could have been in the 1880s, the 1890s, the 1860s. And it could be this decade. And we could even blow it, and it might be later. God forbid. So what is the timing connected to in the Bible? James says the husbandman has long patience. He waits for the precious fruit to receive the early and the latter rain. And Jesus said that if the good man of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would not have suffered his house to be broken in. So what Jesus said is watch. What I say to you is watch. What the prophets have said to us is watch. Be ready. Be zealous. Paul said in Galatians, he said, it's good to be zealously affected. Even though they've affected you zealously in a way that's not good, he said, but it is good to be zealously affected in a thing that is good. So if you have spent your last 72 hours excitedly sharing one of those videos about the time, well, it's good to be excited about something that is good. Now you can start sharing about the three angels' messages, sharing about the truth. That don't let, don't go from a false excitement to a dead formalism. Go from a false excitement to a proper zeal. That's what we need today is proper zeal. One that won't disgust the public when our little short predictions end up being falsified by time. I hope you understand. Let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, I ask that you would bless us, that you would teach us what is right and true. And if I've said anything here that is faulty, would you please weaken the influence of that thing and lead people to study for themselves? I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.